Good morning. It's good to be with you in Banbridge Baptist Church this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you today. We do pray that the pastor and Christine will know refreshment these days and uh, enjoy their holiday, their time off. We do thank God for their ministry and again for the encouragement that that ministry is to us week by week as we listen in also over the internet. What a days of opportunity we have of being able to share uh, over the internet and share the gospel over the internet these days and so many people that are listening in to the message of the gospel. The psalmist in Psalm 40 reminds us, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit and out of the merry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. And I love this verse. As we come to prayer this morning, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And certainly this morning, as we count our many blessings and name them one by one, surely it does surprise us what the Lord has done. Let's come together this morning with grateful, thankful hearts for the goodness of God to us. Let's bow for a word of prayer and just ask his blessing upon our time together this morning as we seek the Lord, as we worship him together. Let's pray. Our loving and eternal Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for the wonderful privilege again that we have of being able to bow in your holy presence. Father, we thank you that we come non-daring to be afraid today. Lord, we thank you that we come this morning not in our own name or in the name of our church. But Father, we thank you we come in and through that name that's above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning that we come to worship you and we come to praise you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy to us that is new every morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can say above our lives today, great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. Lord we thank you today for every blessing that you've given to us over another week since last we met together like this. Father we thank you for your hand over our lives. We thank you Lord for your protection over our lives. Lord we thank you for just the very uh, small things that you give to us day by day that so often we take for granted. We stop this morning and we Lord we say thank you but Lord most of all for those of us who are your children today, we say thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. Lord, around us today are many people that don't know Christ. Lord, around us today are many people that are going heedless and careless, having no thought of God or the things of God. And yet, Lord, this morning you've brought us together in this way. Lord, we thank you this morning for this access that we have right into your throne of grace. Lord, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning as we meet together in this way. Lord, we thank you that you know every need and every heart and every individual who is listening into this recording this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you know every burden and every concern, every heartache, Lord, every trial that we face. Our Lord, we thank you that you're not only the one who knows, but you're the one who cares and the one who understands and the one who comes alongside us to help us in our times of need. Lord, we just pray that you'll minister to hearts today, that Lord, you'll bless hearts today. Lord, we pray that you will come to especially, Lord, maybe some that are listening in this morning that are not saved. Lord, that you'll open their eyes and open their hearts. Our Lord, today will be the day whenever they will throw down their arms of rebellion and trust the Lord Jesus Christ while he is near and while he may be found. We ask that you'll do our hearts good today, that you'll bless us together. Lord, bless the pastor today and Christine, Lord, on holidays. May they know refreshment. May they know your hand upon them. May the Lord continue to know your blessing in their ministry as you use them as they serve the Lord in Banbridge Baptist Church. Just be with us today. Bless us now, we ask it. We give you thanks in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. 
Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be with you this morning and be able to share something with you. I have not been come on my own, but I have brought someone with me to meet you this morning. And it's my little friend. Uh, and well, he comes to lots of places with me. He's traveled all over the world with me. He's traveled to lots of different places and seen lots of different people. But he wanted to come to Banbridge to see all of you this morning, didn't you? Yes. And well, his name begins with R. I wonder, can any of you guess what his name might be? Can you guess? Robert? No. Rupert? No. Well, I'll give you another wee clue. You're probably shouting out lots of different names at the screen this morning, but his name begins with R. His name is the same colour as his hair. Yes, you've got it. His name is Red. And this is my little friend and he wanted to come to see you all this morning. And well, Red, he likes red things, don't you? Yes, and you want me to tell them a story about something? Okay, yes, he likes red things and he likes things that are red. They're small, they're round. Can you guess what they might be? It's not sweets, no. What do you think it might be? Well, I'll give you a clue. You put them in cakes. Yes, they're red and round and sticky. And they are called cherries. And my friend Red, he just loves cherries, don't you? He's going to sit up here. Well, whenever his mum is baking, his mum's a good baker. And whenever his mum is baking, he loves whenever his mum makes cherry cake. Because he helps her get the cherries and put them down into the cake. And so one day his mum called him into the kitchen and his mum was making cherry cake. And well, Red, he decided that he was gonna eat more cherries than he was gonna put in the cake. He loves cherries, don't you? Yes. And so, well, he helped his mum as they made the mixture and then they put the cherries in and he watched them go round and round and round and round in the mixer. And very soon they were going into the baking dish, into the tin and then into the oven. And well, he helped his mum wash up all the dishes afterwards because they were having visitors for tea that night. And well, he wanted to make sure that he would get some cherry cake later on. And so off he went in to play on his PlayStation in the living room. And his mum came in to him a little while later and she said, Red, I've just taken the cake, the cherry cake out of the oven. Do not touch it. I have to go down to the shop here quickly, just at the corner of the road. And I want you to stay here and be a good boy and don't do anything wrong. And so I want you to stay there and play your PlayStation. And so Red, of course, he said, oh, yes, mummy, I'll do that. I am not going to do anything wrong. I'll be a good boy. And he was playing in the middle of his game just at the time that she went out. And so, well, Red, he was sitting there playing on his PlayStation on the race that he was in. But then... could smell something. Oh, it was the cherry cake. And he thought to himself, if only I could go in and just have a little look at it. And so he went into the kitchen and he had a little look at the cherry cake. Mmm, he couldn't wait to taste it. And then he remembered, if only he could get a cherry out of it, he remembered that his mum, sometimes she wasn't a very good baker, and, and sometimes the cherries all went to the bottom of the cake. And I'm sure there's no ladies in Banbridge Baptist that that would happen to. And so Red, he decided that he would have a look. And so he turned the cake the other way around on the cooling rack. And sure enough, there in the bottom of the cake, there were lots of cherries. So Red got a fork out of the drawer. And he stuck it into the cake. And he pulled out a cherry. And he ate a cherry. Nom, 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 nom. And then he stuck it in again, and then he got another cherry, and he, he had another one, and another one, and soon oh, there was a big hole in the bottom of the cake. And he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll just turn it up the right way around, I'll brush all the crumbs away, and then I'll go back into my PlayStation. And so that's exactly what he did. And of course the door opened and mum came in just a few minutes later. Red, have you been a good boy? What do you think he said? Did he go, no? Of course not. He said, 
Yes, Mum. Of course I've been a good boy. You didn't touch anything? No, I didn't touch anything. I've just been here playing my PlayStation. Well, that was fine. Later on, the visitors came and they had their meal together and Red was a good boy. He was at the table and then just before they were bringing out the coffee and the cake, he said, could I please be excused? And so his mum looked at him. But you're having cherry cake, it's your favourite, he said. But I'm so full I don't want any more. She thought that was a wee bit strange. That was fine. Red, that night later on, whenever the visitors had gone, got into bed. And he lay down in bed. But he couldn't sleep. And his mum came up the stairs to tuck him in. Red, why are you still awake? I just can't sleep, he said. Okay, well you try to go back to sleep again. And so he lay down again. Ugh. But he couldn't sleep. And he began to count the sheep. One, two, three, four, five, six. And he went on and on and on. And he still couldn't sleep. Poor Red. His mum came back up the stairs again. She said, Red, you're still not asleep. No, mum. Then she said, Red, something very peculiar has happened. What is it, mum, he said. She said, Red, whenever I went to cut the cherry cake tonight, there was a big hole in the bottom of it. Do you know how that could have happened? And he lay there. And he thought for a wee minute. Uh, the cat did it. She said the cat did it? Yes, yes mum. The cat did it. The cat put a big hole in the bottom of the cherry cake. And she looked at him. And she said Red. That's the first cat that I've ever known. To use a dinner fork. Because there were big fork marks left in the bottom of the cake. You see, Red did something wrong, didn't he? Red didn't admit to the wrong thing that he had done. And Red was found out. You see, the Bible God's word reminds us in Numbers 33 and verse 23. It reminds us there, be sure your sin will find you out. Sometimes we can cover things up and we think people don't know. But there's someone who knows everything, someone who sees everything, someone who hears everything that we do. And it's maybe not our parents at home, the folk who look after us. It's maybe not the pastor in our church, but the person who sees and knows and hears everything that we say and do is God. And we need to live to please him. We need to serve the Lord, don't we, with all of our lives. We need to listen to what God says, to read his word. And to obey his word and to live for him. Now I hope you've listened really well today. And I hope that you've learned something from my little friend Red today. Because if you do something wrong, most likely you'll be found out by the grown-ups. And it's easier to tell the truth, isn't it? Than to tell lies. Now, Red, are you glad to see the boys and girls there? Yeah, okay. And maybe sometime again... You'll see my little friend Red and he'll be able to come and visit you there in Banbridge. Thank you for listening so well to our children's talk today. Thank you for standing with us and praying for us in the work of Acre Gospel Mission, Acre International. On behalf of Victor and Audrey and myself and Karen, we want to say thank you to so many people in Banbridge Baptist who do pray for us and stand with us in the work. Thank you for your support, uh, both prayerfully and financially especially during these difficult days of COVID-19. We're so thankful for what the Lord is doing and what the Lord has done. We can say above it all, great is thy faithfulness. As we look back over 84 years of the work, the Lord has been faithful and we want to thank the Lord for all of his faithfulness to all of our workers scattered throughout the world. Thank you for praying for the work in Brazil. Again, there are 54,000 people that have died in Brazil with COVID-19. And of course, that's only those that are known about. Please pray for our pastors in the remote parts of Acre and Amazonas as they serve the Lord there. Pray for our pastors in the northeast of Brazil. It was a real privilege to be over there back in January time and to be able to visit the pastors and see the vision and the uh, fervor and the, 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 the compassion and passion that they have to reach out to a world that is lost around them. Those pastors have seen a tremendous work done for God down through the years in the towns and villages that they're working in. And we value your prayers for them as they serve the Lord there in the Northeast. 
Do pray for two new church builds in Pasifica, a town where we have a pastor and his wife serving the Lord there, uh, Louise and Aldenegi, who are serving the Lord in that town. Two years ago, they felt the call of God to go to that town and to reach out in that town because there was no gospel witness there. They started and rented a little garage, just a garage with a, a, a roller up, a roller door. And there they have their meetings week by week. But because they have got now got a piece of ground and they've started to build a new building there, we're so thankful to the Lord for this opportunity of building a physical building, but also to see God building his church there and souls coming to know Christ as their saviour. Please pray for that work that God will bless in it. Also, uh, we have a new pastor and his wife just with us for just over a year, Pastor Abraham and his wife Priscilla, and they're working in a place called San Jose, a small town, again with uh, very little gospel work there in that area. And we are thankful to the Lord that a lady from the, the, the church, one of the churches nearby, felt again the, the burden of God to give them a piece of ground. And there they're able now, just started to build a, a new building there as well. And pray for that work too, that we'll see much fruit for the glory of God in the days ahead. Thank you for praying for the work in Portugal. The churches in Portugal have now gone back. Uh, it's very different. There's a lot of legislation, a lot of uh, rules and regulations uh, in churches going back there. People are sitting with their visors on and their masks on in church. They're not allowed to sing in church. So it's very different. Uh, our church services are also through Zoom and the internet as well there. And pray for our pastors who are serving the Lord there in Portugal, that God will bless them. And again, as many on sea have listened to the services, that God will speak to hearts and the joy of pointing many folk to Christ. People from right across the world are watching in week by week. Pray also for the work in Lanzarote, for Ricardo and Sandra there, and for the ongoing ministry in Arecife. Again, the church there has gone back, again with many rules and regulations, but they've started back there again uh, just last week and pray that the Lord will bless them. Uh, their prayer meetings, their ladies' meetings, men's meetings, discipleship meetings, uh, everything but the youth meeting and the Sunday morning service uh, is online as well. And they're so thankful to the Lord for the means of internet and Facebook and, and uh, uh, Zoom been able to share the gospel with individuals but you're part of the work and thank you for praying for the work and again Victor and myself have great opportunities I've been able to preach on the internet uh, a lot of drive-in churches are happening now we have opportunities to uh, go and preach and drive in churches uh, over these next number of weeks through the summer and we're thankful for these opportunities and again for your continued prayers for us and for our ministry with Acre Gospel Mission. We're going to read, if you have God's word there, we're going to read together from Acts chapter 11 and commencing to read at verse 19 of the chapter down to verse 26. Verse 19 to verse 26 of Acts chapter 11. Verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cy Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, and he, uh, uh, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart that they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We'll end there at verse 26, and we know that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts this evening. Let's bow for a little word of prayer, and then we will share some thoughts from God's word uh, this morning, please. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity of being able to come around your word today. 
Lord, we thank you that we can come in freedom. And Lord, we think of so many people across our world that are persecuted because of their faith today. So many, Lord, that can't meet together. So many, Lord, that can't come together like we can on the internet today or, or, or can't meet together physically. Bless them where they are today. Lord, we ask that you will do their hearts good. We ask, Lord, that you will meet with them where they are today and they will know your presence with them in a very real way. Father, we thank you for your word that is truth. And Lord, we just pray that you will apply the truth of your word to our hearts again this morning as we have read it together, as we share these thoughts. We pray that you will use them for your honour and for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. We ask these things, giving you thanks in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. As I have been in contact with many individuals over the years, there's one thing that I really thank the Lord for, and that is friends. Now, I'm not talking about Facebook friends, because quite often we have got friends on Facebook that we have never met, maybe that we don't really know very well, and maybe sometimes if you're out, they wouldn't even say hello to you. Not friends like that. I don't mean those who are with you one day and gone the next. I mean those who stick with you through thick or thin. And uh, believe me, I have been both thick and thin. Uh, so I have. So it's funny that um, we have so many friends, so many people that we can call friends. Many of us have been on the road long enough to know that friendships can either make a person or break a person. It's important that we choose our friends wisely. Sadly, some friendships can lead to the downfall of many a person. One of my best friends, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying this today if he's even listening in, one of my best friends who, who was with me in Bible college, he got into wrong company. He went away far from the Lord. He lived a life that wasn't very pleasing to the Lord and certainly wasn't very honouring to the Lord. Over the years, we continued to pray for him. We prayed that God would work in his heart, that God would move by his spirit in his life, and that he would come back to the Lord. I got a phone call one morning, just a few years ago. Victor had been conducting a mission up uh, outside Cookstown, and he rang me one night. I was coming from a meeting in Balamina, and he was coming from the meeting in Cookstown. And he rang me, and he said to me, I have a wee bit of good news for you tonight. Because you know your friend Stephen, well his wife has come to know Christ as her saviour at our mission this evening. What an answer to prayer. We prayed on that through that, that God would speak to Stephen and Stephen would come back to the Lord. As I said, I got a phone call one morning, completely out of the blue. I, I wasn't just sure who was talking to me on the other end of the phone. They were trying to book me for a meeting and, and actually trying to trick me. They were making a joke of it. And so... As the conversation went on, he told me that it was Stephen on the phone. He then began to talk to me and tell me about how that his wife had come to the Lord through the mission, which we knew. And then he said how that God had been working in his life. And he said, after 27 years of being far from God, the other night, I just bowed my knee. I cried to the Lord, as he said, just like a little child. And I came back to the Lord. What an answer to prayer. We thank God for friends, good friends, friends that encourage us, friends that stand with us. People that help us day by day. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 gives us a word of warning. He says there are evil communications corrupt good manners. Or what he's saying here is bad company corrupts good morals. Benjamin Franklin once said, be careful and slow in choosing your friends, but be slower in changing them. Alexander Craig once said, a man is known by the company that he keeps out of. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Young people today, if you're listening to this meeting this morning, choose your friends carefully. Choose your friends carefully. Choose your partner in life carefully. I've seen, and I'm sure for many today, we have seen many young people, many young believers 
who were once on fire for God, once loved God with all of their heart and served the Lord, and they met up unsaved with unsaved people, became friends with them, and it didn't pull them up, it pulled them down. It discouraged them from the things of God, took them away from the things of God. Sometimes we have seen unsaved people that have come into the lives of believers and the person has married them and today they're far from God. Choose your friends carefully. Choose your partner in life carefully. J.B. Phillips in his translation in Romans 12 verse 2 be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may approve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. J.B. Phillips, his translation says this, and I love these words. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Maybe you're online this morning and you're listening to this service. And maybe you're still not saved. And maybe you're not saved this morning because of your friends. I know as a young person growing up in Banbridge Baptist Church and going along to school in Banbridge and I had many friends and going along to church and listening to the gospel and hearing that I needed to be saved and challenged week after week after week through the ministry of God's word, through the ministry and youth fellowship, God challenged my heart but I was afraid of what my friends would say, how they would react if I had to go and tell them that I trusted in Christ. We ran about together, a whole crowd of us. We were best friends. And I remember the night that I got saved, or the day after I got saved, going to the friends and saying to them, last night I trusted in Christ. One of them said to me, I'll give you a week because, well, you'll never be able to stick it. I could never have stuck it. But I'm so glad that Christ held on to me. And I'm so glad this morning that he is the one who was my strength He's the one who's our refuge. He is the one who promises that he will never leave us and that he will never forsake us. And maybe you're listening this morning, as I've said, and you're still not saved because you're worried about what your friends will say. You're worried about what your family will say. Someone once said rightly, our friends can laugh us into hell, but they can never laugh us out of us. My friend this morning Trust in Christ. He is the only way. He is the only answer. He's the only one who will never leave you, who will never let you down, who will never forsake you. Some friendships can be harmful, but in contrast to that, some friendships can be very helpful too. Thank the Lord for people who we can call true friends, those who belong to the Lord, those who bring uh, us uh, along the pathway of life and bring us closer to the Lord. Someone once said, you can always tell a true friend that even when you make a fit of yourself, they don't feel that you've done a permanent job. One who is always with you, no matter what the problem. One who will come alongside you, no matter what the sorrow, no matter what the burden, no matter what the hurt, no matter what the heartache. Those we can talk to and we know it won't go any further. Those we can share our burdens with. Those who we can, who will put their arm around us. Of course, not in lockdown. Those who will encourage us along the way. And as we read through the, the word of God, and as we read here through uh, the, the, the letters to Paul, we see that the Apostle Paul had many friends. He drew people to himself like a magnet draws metal. In the book of Acts, Dr. Luke mentions many of Paul's friends, and I'm sure that you'll agree with me that the figure of Paul certainly overshadows all of them. Someone said, it's hard to get a, limp, a glimpse of Paul's friends whenever he's about. Sir so Winston Churchill once said, we make a life be what, by what we give, and we make a living by what we get. Uh, and one of Paul's friends who made a life by what he gave was Barnabas. We've read about him in these few verses here this morning. His original name was Joseph, but because there was a certain graciousness about him, the apostles nicknamed him Barnabas, the son of consolation, the son of encouragement, the son of exhortation. Barnabas was knowing for his willingness to seek out those who were struggling and to encourage them in the work of the Lord. I'm sure we can all think of someone this morning 
in our lives. Someone who we could call a, a modern day Barnabas. Someone who comes alongside us to encourage us. These characters in scripture are not merely footnotes. But they're there for our learning aren't they? And if anyone could teach us the ministry of encouragement. It's Barnabas. You see, there are so many people out there today who want to discourage us. Sadly, there are many believers this morning who also want to discourage us in the work of God. No matter what we do is wrong. No matter what we say is wrong. And so often we can get pulled down by people like this, can't we? People who will try to destroy us, sometimes out of jealousy. They try to destroy us or try to pull us down. I want us to look this morning at the character of Barnabas. Just a few very simple thoughts that I want to leave with you today as we think of Barnabas here. We see, first of all, that Barnabas was Christ-like. We first meet him in the very early days of the church, when it was full of fire and fervour, full of love for Christ. His name indicated Christ-likeness. He was known as the son, as the son of consolation in Acts 4, verse 36. The word here used for consolation is parakletos, the same word as paraclete that is used in John 16, referring to the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the one who comes alongside us to help us, to encourage us. This was Barnabas. And this Christ-like spirit earned him the reputation even among the apostles. He was a man who had a big heart. He had the gift of getting alongside people in their hour of need and bringing hope and bringing comfort. Speaking peace to the wounded. Speaking peace to those that were broken in heart. He had a heart for people. Folks, that's so important today. As believers that we have a heart for others. There's a wee song we sometimes sing and it says, Give me a heart for others that I might win them for thee. C.H. Spurgeon once said, If a man would have a great congregation, he must have a great heart. His heart must be a harbour that a fleet can anchor in. Not only did his name indicate Christ-likeness, but his nature too. Barnabas was a gracious gentleman. He exemplified Christ. He was a genuine man of God. His life portrayed that, that he was one who was sold out for God. His life was one that was on fire for God. J.B. Phillips called him a Christian gentleman, a genuine man of God. Someone once said, one live coal can set the whole stack on fire. Now you know if you're lighting the fire that that's true. One live coal can set the whole stack on fire. And folks, that's what we need today, isn't it? We need a people who are on fire for God. In our nation today, in our province today, in our church in Banbridge or our church wherever we go to today, we need a people who are on fire for God. A people who are sold out for God. A people whose hearts are burning for God. That's what the world wants to see. Jim Elliot said once, am I ignitable? God deliver me from the dead asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of the Spirit that I may be a flame. Oh, that our prayer would be today that God would set us on fire afresh for Him. William MacDonald said, A disciple can be forgiven if he does not have great mental ability. He can be forgiven even if he does not display great physical prowess. But no disciple can be excused if he does not have zeal. If his heart is not aflame with the red hot passion for the Saviour, he stands condemned. Barnabas here was a character, was a man, a, a man who was sold out for God. And as I said, I believe if we want to see our nation turned upside down for God today, then we need to be a people who are sold out for God. In Acts eleven twenty three, Barnabas was encouraging. He was exhorting the new converts at Antioch to cleave to the Lord. He emphasised to them dedication of heart. They were to cleave or they were to cling on to the Lord. He encouraged them to love the Lord, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to obey the word of the Lord and to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. What a challenge to us today. To cling, to cleave to the Lord. 
to love the Lord, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to obey the word of the Lord, to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Dr. Luke's testimony of this man Barnabas, his spiritual profile, the real man, was Christ-like. What a challenge to each of us. What do people see as they look at us today? What do people see in our workplace? What do people see in our home? What do people see in the shops as we rub shoulders with people day by day? I was speaking to a pastor recently and he was saying that one of the biggest problems in the church is believers who are one thing in the church and another thing outside of the church. What do others see in us today? What example are we to the world around us? The people that we live beside, as I said, the people we rub shoulders with. What do people see? Do they see Christ in us? Barnabas was Christ-like. We also see, secondly, that Barnabas was charitable. In Acts chapter 4, Dr. Luke records for us how the resources were shared around the needy believers. No doubt many of these believers were visitors to Jerusalem, having come up for the feasts, and because of this would have needed to rely on the believers there to meet their daily needs. Those with surplus property and possessions the word of God tells us that they sold them and they placed the proceeds at the apostles' feet. What these believers did was voluntary and motivated by their love for Christ. Barnabas was a Levite, a member of the priestly tribe of Israel. It's very unlikely that he being a priest would have been very wealthy. In Numbers 18 verse 20, the Levites were not permitted to own land. This law might have only been applicable in Israel as Barnabas had property in Cyprus. But whatever the reason, he had acquired a piece of property. Cyprus, it was famous for its vineyards, its wheat fields, its oil, its figs. It was a secular Canaan. And anyone who had land there was rich and influential. During, during the early days of the church, many men sold their possessions and they put them at the apostles' disposal. We read that he had sold it. He had brought the money to the apostles' feet. He was willing to surrender all that he had for the sake of the gospel. That's another challenge to us today, isn't it? Sadly today, churches are closing. Sadly today, mission halls are closing. Sadly today, mission organisations are closing down. Sadly today, missionaries are coming off the field because they don't have the finances to stay there. Someone said, when the Holy Spirit of God is at work, giving is a blessing, not a burden. You know, I've met many Barnabases in my day. I've met many Barnabases in my days in the work. Those who have given and given and given again. There was a lady outside Balamina many, many years ago. She was widowed. She had two or three children to bring up on her own. They hadn't got very much. But you know, they went to church on Sunday and they went to the mission hall, to the prayer meetings, to the missionary meetings every week. Sitting in a missionary meeting one night, she had her two sons sitting beside her. And she took a pound out of her purse. Now in those days, a pound was a pound, a pound note. And she placed it in the plate for the missionary offering. And her son looked up into her face and he said, Mom, that was your last pound. What are we going to do? And the mother looked at her son and she said, Son, the God who provided that pound will provide the next pound. I've been challenged and encouraged even in the work of Acre through many people that have sacrificed. Sacrificed to keep our missionaries on the field. There was a lady phoned me one day. She asked me to meet her in Belfast in a coffee shop. Now you know looking at me that I don't refuse going to a coffee shop. And so we sat in the coffee shop together and then she took an envelope out of her handbag and she gave it to me. She said, I don't want you to read that until you get home. It's a little gift because the missionaries need it more than I do. This lady was a pensioner. She lived in a little council flat. She didn't have very much at all. And so I came home and I opened up the envelope and I began to read the letter that was in it and the gift that she had given. She said, this is my heating allowance for the year. I get that from the government. 
She said, but the missionaries need it more than I do. I put a couple of pounds away a week. And I have enough to pay my heating bill. But the missionaries need it more than I do. And I'm not ashamed to tell you today that I sat in the office and I cried as I read that letter. Knowing the person who gave it, it very much challenged my heart. And I actually didn't tell our workers who it was, but I sent the letter around all of them by email to let them know just the sacrifice that people make to keep them on the field. Isn't it a thrill to be used of God, to be able to meet the needs of others? Many of the people who have done the most for God are not those who are up front or maybe standing in a pulpit every week, but those who are behind the scenes, being faithful to the word of God and to the God of the word. We can't all preach. We can't all stand in a pulpit, but we can all be encouragers, can't we? We can send a little card, we can write a letter, we can lift the phone. Now, maybe not in lockdown, we can meet someone for coffee, but we can do that. Maybe normally, or as months go on, we could do that. We can all say hello, we can smile, we can shake a hand. We can hug a hurting soul. We can help to be a shoulder to cry on. We can shed a tear. We can have a listening ear. We can give of our time. We can give of our talents. We can give of our treasures. We can serve the Lord together. God is looking for ordinary people. Just like you and me. People like Barnabas. Christ-like. Charitable. But then we see also, not only was he Christ-like, not only was he charitable, but we see that Barnabas also showed courage. He was courageous. We see his courage when Saul of Tarsus, who was not long converted on the Damascus Road, wanted to join the fellowship. But because of his testimony, no one ever believed that he could be saved. Saul was in dire need of a friend, someone who would come alongside him, someone who would encourage him. The fellowship of Jerusalem should have been the place for refuge for him, where he could find love and compassion. But sadly, it was a place to give him the cold shoulder. Many of the fellowships like Jerusalem were filled with fear and suspicion whenever a stranger arrived at the door. But Barnabas had the courage to get alongside Saul. This persecutor of believers, in his need, Barnabas realised that God had changed Saul's life. Possibly Barnabas found Saul somewhere in Jerusalem, lonely and fearful, and said to him, you leave it to me. I'll take you to the apostles. I'll tell him what the Lord has done for you. And that's exactly what happened. He was able to persuade the fellowship in Jerusalem that Saul was genuine. He was Saul's spokesman. And Saul found Barnabas to be a brother who cared. It takes courage to encourage. God only knows the effect of a little word of encouragement. In a world where we're constantly seeing people ripped apart, where we're constantly seeing people hurt and destroyed, we need to be encouragers. Can we look over the past week and say that we've encouraged someone? Could you be an encourager today to someone? To lift the phone, to send them a little note, to tell them that you're there for them, that you're praying for them? He was Christ-like, he was charitable, he was courageous. Barnabas also showed cooperation. We see here that he was sent by the elders in Jerusalem to Antioch. There was a great spiritual awakening there. God moved through the people through the foolishness of preaching. And verse 21 tells they preached the Lord Jesus and a great number believed and turned on to the Lord. Antioch was the capital of Syria, 300 miles north of Jerusalem. A population of half a million. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. It had magnificent buildings. Its main street was more than four miles long. It was paved with marble. It had a busy port. It was a centre for luxury. It attracted all kinds of people, especially wealthy, retired Roman officials. But it was a wicked city. And when the persecuted believers arrived in Antioch, they did not 
feel intimidated by the magnificence of the place or the people there. God's word and God's witness was burning in their hearts. And of course the news of what was happening soon spread to Jerusalem. And so the church sent its representative to Antioch to investigate the situation and to confirm the news of the reports that they were hearing. And verse 23 here tells us, when he came, Barnabas came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad. Barnabas fully cooperated with the people. He encouraged them to cleave to the Lord. He had an effective ministry. Scripture reminds us that much people were added to the church. But in the middle of it all, we see that Barnabas had a problem. He couldn't handle the situation. He couldn't handle it himself. And so we read there in verse 25, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. It takes a big man with a big heart to discover a more talented person than himself. And then go out and to find him and to be next to him. But we see that Barnabas here was happy to take a step back and let Saul or Paul take the lead. And so they both ministered the word of God for a whole year there in Antioch. And so we could go on and on looking further into the life of Barnabas. I know that time doesn't permit because time is ticking away here. We could talk about his commissioning from the opening verses of chapter 13 and verse 2. It tells us there that they prayed and the Holy Spirit told them to separate. Barnabas and Saul had spent eight years together in ministry. And now they were going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. The church at Antioch confirmed their calling and commissioned them and sent them forth. Verse 5 of chapter 13 tells us that John Mark joined them on their journey too. And of course, as we know, that not long into the journey that John Mark deserted them and returned to Jerusalem. But I'm sure that the encourager, Barnabas, tried to encourage him, tried to support him, tried to do all that he could for him. But he'd made up his mind to go back. And by the end of chapter 15 here, we read that they had completed their first missionary journey. And in verse 36, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord. Their commission. We haven't time to speak about their controversy. Although John Mark had let them down earlier, Barnabas wanted to give him another chance, another opportunity. He wanted to bring John Mark on the second missionary journey. But in chapter 15 and verse 38, we see that Paul thought it wasn't a good idea to take him. And sadly, the two men had a row, a sickening row. And in verse 39, it tells us that the contention was so great amongst them that they parted company. These two men were great leaders in the early church. No doubt they were on the devil's hit list. They divided their territory and they separated. Paul took Silas to Syria and Cilicia. And Barnabas took John Mark and they travelled to Cyprus. Who was right and who was wrong? Well it really doesn't make a difference. Now there were two teams instead of one team. Paul looked at the people and asked. What can they do for God's work? Barnabas looked and asked, what can God's work do for them? You know, we never hear of Barnabas again. But his ministry and the ministry of encouragement had far-reaching consequences. We haven't time to talk about his compassion either today. Barnabas gave John Mark a second chance and his life was salvaged. You know, I, I was thinking how many times... Have we seen fellow believers fall by the wayside? Maybe even in our church in Banbridge. How many times have we seen people fall by the wayside? And so often what do we do? We kick them when they're down, don't we? We don't get alongside them. We don't lift the phone and help them. Our natural tendency is to wash our hands of them and to go on. But God's plan, however, is very different. We're not to kick our brother when he's down. We need to reach out in love and humility to help him to be restored to the place of fellowship and the place of service. My friend Stephen, when he left Bible college, he said that no one kept in touch with him. I was probably only the only people that kept in touch with him down the years. And he remarked about that today. He said, whenever I was down, there was no one to help me. No one to lift me up. 
No one to encourage me. And that really challenged my heart, folks. Where would we be today if God wasn't a God of second chances? Barnabas was influential. Barnabas was sympathetic. A tower of strength as he ministered and he encouraged people. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 11, before Paul died in Rome, who did he request? Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable unto me for the ministry. Barnabas saw potential. He looked beyond John Mark's feelings. He took time to be an encourager. But for Barnabas, the son of encouragement, would we have the gospel of Mark today? Would we have Paul's letters today? Friend, if we're going to be Christ-like, then we need to rethink our priorities in life, don't we? God first, others second, and ourselves last. You know, in doing this, God will be glorified. Others will be edified. And we will be satisfied. Who could we encourage today? Who could we get alongside in the week that's ahead? Lift the phone. Write a little note. Send them an email. Send them a message to encourage them. That we might be Christ-like. But that we might take an example also from Barnabas. Christ-like, charitable, courageous, cooperative, compassionate. That we might be on fire for God and serve the Lord with all of our hearts in these last days. May God bless just these very few thoughts on his word today. And may God use them for his honour and for his glory. Let's just have a little word of prayer together, please. Our loving Father, again, we just want to thank you today for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is like a sharp two-edged sword piercing deep in our hearts. Father, we thank you for the examples of those that were Christ-like in your word. Thank you, Lord, for the examples of those that we read of in your word, that we look up to in your word. And we thank you this morning for the example of Barnabas. We thank you this morning, Lord, again for his Christ-likeness. Thank you, Lord, for his charitableness. Thank you for his courageousness. Thank you for his cooperation. Thank you for his compassion. Thank you, Lord, for the example that he set as we read about him in your word. Lord, we ask that you'll help us to be all of those things today. That you'll help us, Lord, to be the people that you want us to be. Lord, as we reach out to the communities around us, as we reach out, Lord, to our neighbours and friends and our families, that, Lord, they might see something different in us. That they might see Christ. And be drawn to him. Lord we just pray that you'll bless each person. That's listening today. We thank you that you know every need and every heart. That you know every individual. You know every burden. Every concern today. And Lord we just pray that you'll meet needs. That you'll minister to hearts. And that you'll do our hearts good in this your day. Lord we just thank you for our time together. And we ask that you'll bless us now. And bless your word. In Jesus name. Amen.